Now, another chance to catch our one-off air crash investigation special, examining the tragic events of October 31st, 1994, in the freezing skies above Chicago. Halloween, 1994. You haven't heard any more from this controller chick, huh? No, not a word. A commuter plane circles outside Chicago, waiting for clearance to land. Eagle Flight 184, descend and maintain 8,000. Without warning, the controls snap to the right. The plane plunges straight for the ground. The behavior of the crew and the air traffic controllers would be examined. Pilots would question the safety of an airplane. The airplane will have a nasty tendency to go out of control. Investigators travel the world for answers. The crash makes Roselawn one of aviation's darkest words. October the 31st, 1994. American Eagle Flight 4184 left Indianapolis, Indiana 15 minutes ago. It's heading to Chicago. There are 68 passengers and crew on board. Through the clouds, the aircraft begins to experience some turbulence. I'm gonna keep them in their seats in this shop. No sense in taking chances. Captain Orlando Aguiar is in command of today's flight. It's supposed to be his day off. He volunteered for this flight to make extra money. His wife is expecting their second child. See if we can get above this. Center, any chance flight 184 can climb to 16,000? First officer Jeff Gagliano is handling the flying duties on this leg of the flight. He programs the autopilot to climb to a less turbulent altitude. Jeff actually was working on his uh, dad's ranch uh, in Wisconsin at the, just before he came in for that trip on uh, Halloween that day. Getting on a horse or getting in an airplane, those were two of the things that Jeff loved most. Flight 4184 is an ATR-72, a groundbreaking new aircraft built in France. Cost efficient and comfortable, the plane has become popular on short runs. This flight is just one of five short hops the crew will be making today. It's Amanda Holberg's first day on the job as a flight attendant with American Eagle. She's paired with Sandy Modaf, a seasoned veteran. Aguiar and Gagliano have flown this route countless times and know it by heart. When you're flying from Indianapolis to Chicago, you're flying through some of the busiest uh, airspace in the world. As Flight 4184 approaches Chicago O'Hare, the pilots begin the descent to 10,000 feet. Chicago Center, we have discretion down to uh, 10,000. We're on our way down now. Right. 
In Chicago, controller Michelle Willman is returning from a break. The trainee controller is still working under the supervision of a monitor. She's told that traffic into O'Hare is facing potential delays because of weather. She will have to be prepared to put some flights on hold. Operations into and out of O'Hare are handled on a priority basis. It's not necessarily a first-come, first-served basis. Um, international flights arriving to O'Hare because of their fuel status get priority, and then the turboprops come in at the end. Eagle 184, hold southeast on Victor 7. Chicago Center, Roger, hold southeast on Victor 7. Eagle 184. Flight 4184 must now fly a racetrack-shaped holding pattern over northwestern Indiana. The crew has little to do as they wait for air traffic controllers to give them permission to land. Can I get you boys anything? I'm good. Stereo? Oh, you don't have a hard job. We do have it pretty easy. I think it's a real high deck angle in these turns. Yeah. We're just following in the air right now. You want flaps 15? We'll bring the nose down. Sure. I guess Sandy's going to move now. <laughs> The crew needs to let the airline know about their delay. It could affect the rest of the day's schedule. Crews use text messages to communicate with dispatchers, so they don't tie up radio frequencies. Can I let them know how much fuel we got? Sure. Space, F, U, E, L, is that? We've got uh, 3,600 pounds. Shit, once they let us out of the hold and forget they're down, we'll get the overspeed warning. I can't hold any more, man. <laughs> Just doing circles up here, yep. Yeah, we got plenty of gas. We could be up here for a long while. Hey, bro. Yeah. I'm getting busy with the ladies back here. Ooh. Yeah, so if I don't make it up there in the next 15, 20 minutes, you know why. If you're a touchdown, I'll give you a ring. Oh, no, I'll be up right now. You, uh, you haven't heard any more from this controller chick, huh? No, not a word. Eagle Flight 184, descend and maintain 8,000. Eagle, Eagle Flight 184 uh, should be about 10 minutes uh, till you're cleared in. Thank you. The flight is allowed to descend. Are we out of the hole? No, we're just going down to 8,000. Then a warning. I knew we'd do that. The plane is going too fast to fly with its flaps extended. I was trying to keep it at 180. Gagliano retracts the flaps. There's a strange sound coming through the fuselage. Suddenly, the control column turns sharply to the right. The controls won't budge. The plane is falling from the sky. The pilots begin to recover control. But then it happens again.
Flight 4184 has crashed into a field just outside Roselawn, Indiana. Both pilots, the two flight attendants and all 64 passengers are dead. The Roselawn crash would soon become one of the most important accidents in aviation history. It will lead investigators to new conclusions about a string of older crashes. The morning after the crash of American Eagle Flight 4184, a team from the National Transportation Safety Board is on the scene just outside Roselawn, Indiana. Greg Fife is the lead investigator. The morning that we arrived at the accident site, it was cold, it was overcast, it was one of those drizzly, dank days. All you could smell was the jet A or the kerosene fuel, and because it was muddy and wet, you had that odor or that aroma of dirt. And so with all of those smells, that, I mean, that really evokes some emotion there. And now you have to walk through that field and actually start to do your job. The crash site is soaked in jet fuel and hydraulic fluid. Human remains are scattered everywhere. The site is declared a biohazard. With 4184, uh, was one of those types of accidents where there was very little left of the airplane. Investigators know that the way the wreckage is spread out can tell them how the plane hit the ground. Because there was a fan-shaped debris pattern and it was spread out over a very large area, we knew that the impact was very shallow but at a very high speed. The airplane's two flight recorders are found intact in the tail. They're taken to the NTSB's labs for analysis. The data on the recorders could provide the clues investigators need to solve the mystery. But extracting the data takes time. In the meantime, investigators look for the location of key pieces of wreckage. The first things we typically look for are the four corners of the airplane. The NTSB's Bob Swain leads that search. You're looking for the nose and the tail and the two wingtips because if you can tell where the four corners of the airplane are, you get an initial idea of whether the pilot was in control or not. The plane's four corners are far from each other. The nose and cockpit are completely destroyed. This tells investigators that the plane hit the ground nose first in a shallow but rapid descent. The fact that the plane wasn't in a steep descent on impact indicates that the pilots had some control in the final seconds before the crash. They just ran out of room to pull up. Investigator Bob Swain, meanwhile, has recovered some of the plane's instruments, including its attitude director indicator, also known as the artificial horizon. It's a key instrument that tells pilots if they're flying level. If it malfunctioned, it could have misled the crew and caused them to make mistakes. We had a pretty good idea of the attitude of the airplane at impact, so it would really help at that point to see if the pilots had the same view of the flight that we found as they hit the ground. Get the lights for me, please. A lot of the cockpit pieces use a fluorescent paint or something similar. And when they contact each other, little, little bits of the paint transfer. If we look at those with a black light, we can see things that the naked eye cannot see. There's a good imprint here. The force of the impact has left tiny scratches on the shattered instrument. Swaim discovers that the attitude indicator seems to have been working. Its final readings show the plane was leveling off. The instrument coincides with the plane's actual position on impact. It indicated that at least the flight instruments that the pilots would have been looking at 
were appropriate, they were proper, that the pilots had something to fly by. The discovery means that the pilots knew their plane was diving towards the ground. Investigator Greg Fife is getting a clearer picture of the flight's final seconds. Now he wants to know about the history of this flight before it fell from the sky. One of the elements of the investigation, of course, was to look at air traffic control. Eagle 184 holds southeast on... Fife learns that Flight 4184 had been in a holding pattern southeast of Chicago for 39 minutes before the crash. When we looked at the air traffic control records, we found that the flow rate, that is, the number of airplanes that were going into Chicago here at the time, had to be reduced because of the weather moving through the area. I do apologize for all the delays. One of the aspects that we found was that one of the controllers in the facility was relatively new. They were considered a trainee. Had an inexperienced controller put Flight 4184 in peril? Chief Investigator Greg Fife wants to know more about the weather conditions along the holding pattern. I want weather data, pilot reports, it's atmospheric conditions, it's Doppler radar, anything you can find. Flight 4184 wasn't the only plane circling O'Hare that day. Several other planes were also on hold. They all landed safely. Interviews with the pilots of some of those planes give investigators an important clue. But one after another, they all experienced icing, some as much as three quarters of an inch. Many of the pilots report the same thing, ice. Dr. Marsha Politovich works at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. She's one of the leading experts on icing and the danger it poses to aircraft. It essentially changes the shape of the wing while you're in flight. It creates drag, it reduces lift, it causes performance and handling problems, and it's just not a good thing to have. Investigators examine weather records from the day of the crash. They find a disturbing pattern of reports of icing all along a cold front near Chicago. But the reports describe the icing as light to moderate. Perhaps the size of the commuter plane was a factor in this crash. Large jets generally fly above the dangerous conditions inside a cloud. But the ATR-72 can't do that. Smaller plane can't fly as high. They're stuck in the icing environment for longer. They may not have de-icing equipment. And if they get in trouble, they may not have enough excess power to get out of it. Investigators discover that Flight 4184's holding pattern took it through layers of cloud repeatedly. Each time it would have been exposed to icing conditions. Steve Frederick was flying out of Chicago on the morning of the crash. He flew through the same treacherous weather. Each time that I went through that cold front during that day, the uh, weather was intensifying, the ice was getting worse, and I was getting more and more concerned. Frederick asked his captain to pass on a warning about the weather so that other pilots would be alerted to the danger. I found out a little bit later that my captain had never warned dispatch, and these pilots never got the warning about the ice that was out there that day. And there's no feeling in the world that can compare to how badly I felt at that moment. Greg Fife knows that controllers had put several other planes into a holding pattern near Chicago. But they all landed safely after coming out of the hold. This means the controller had not put Flight 4184 in jeopardy. She acted correctly, given the information she had about the weather. 
One of the issues about air traffic control is that the controllers can't just look at their radar screen and identify areas of, of precipitation or icing conditions readily. The controllers don't know that an airplane is sitting in icing conditions unless the pilot provides them with what they call a PIREP or a pilot report. So if, if the crew, in this case, 4184, doesn't provide that information to the controller, then the controller doesn't know that an icing event actually is occurring out there. Fife and his team wonder if the flight crew simply didn't realize they were flying into icy conditions. The plane's cockpit voice recorder provides the answer. I don't know if that's a boy's anything. Ariel? <laughs> you don't have a hard job. <laughs> you do have it pretty easy. Hey, bro. Getting busy with the ladies back here. Oh. At first glance, the crew's behavior seems unprofessional and undisciplined. The first officer was listening to some music. We knew that there were a lot of non-aviation things going on. One of the most contentious elements was how did that affect the crew's performance and their awareness to the situation that was starting to develop. Well, it's much nicer now, flaps 15. Yeah. Showing some ice now. But nine minutes before the crash, the crew had noticed their plane was picking up ice. The pilots must have been aware they were flying through an area of aircraft icing. You haven't heard any more from this controller check, huh? No, not a word. Then, two minutes before the accident, another remark draws the attention of investigators. Still got ice. I see what you mean. The crew knew about the ice. Now investigators need to know what they did about it. The ATR-72 is equipped with sophisticated de-icing devices. It's crucial to know what the crew did about the ice buildup on their wings. This time, the flight data recorder provides the answers. Almost 17 minutes before the crash, something sets off the master caution warning. It could signal a problem in one of the plane's systems. It could also mean the electronic ice detector is picking up the presence of ice. The flight data recorder shows investigators that in response to the alert, Captain Aguiar turned the plane's de-icing system to its maximum setting. The NTSB's Charlie Pereira looks into the performance of the ATR-72. The icing uh, alert system uh, had sounded orally, and they heard it, and they activated protection systems on the airplane. And at the time of the accident, uh, the de-ice systems were on. The flight data recorder shows that after he activated his de-icing system, Captain Aguiar also pushed the throttle forward slightly, increasing the plane's speed. This increased the speed of the air moving over the plane's wings, making it harder for ice to settle there. The pilots had done everything they could to deal with ice buildup on the plane. But were the anti-icing systems actually working? The shattered remains of that de-icing system are now the main focus of the investigation. The airplane was designed in France by a group of French and Italian companies. The de-icing system was part of that design. So the components were made by small French vendors who were located around the countryside, and then they were assembled there in Toulouse into the final airplane. Bob Swaim arrives in France with pieces of the de-icing system. I brought some pieces from flight 4184. The key component to the de-icing system is probably not the black rubber boot that you see on the airplane. 
but the timer that's inside the airplane or the timers and the valves that control those boots. The force of the crash has left telltale markings called index marks. They show the position of the valves at the time of impact. Swain compares them to the original blueprints. Does anything seem out of the ordinary? The trip to France has led to yet another dead end. There was nothing wrong with the plane's de-icing system. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Investigators are puzzled. I'm feeling some ice now. If the crew knew they had ice on their wing and their de-icing system was working, why did the plane crash? Other pilots think they know the answer and decide to speak out. Their decision will dramatically change the course of this investigation. Three weeks after the crash near Roselawn, Indiana, American Eagle pilot Steve Frederick distributes a warning. It says the ATR-72 fleet operated by American Eagle is dangerous in icing conditions. It claims American Eagle pilots have pleaded with the airline and regulators to do something about it, but to no effect. I drafted and, and distributed a brochure in Chicago O'Hare Airport, which essentially warned people about the problems with the ATR aircraft and uh, made an outreach to the public in order to try and get something done because nothing was happening. Steve Frederick has more than a professional interest in the crash of Flight 4184. Co-pilot Jeff Gagliano was his close friend. They graduated from flight school together. Gagliano's death has hit him hard. He made the comment one time that he would probably wind up dying because of ice in an ATR. And it was eerily prophetic. A month after the crash, pilot frustration over the ATR's airworthiness boils over. A group of a dozen pilots refuse to fly, citing risky weather. The airline is forced to cancel flights. And then Steve Frederick goes one step further. He voices his concerns on a US network morning show. We were told this airplane will try and kill you. If you get too slow in ice, the, the airplane will have a nasty tendency to go out of control. When I came back to flying after my appearance on Good Morning America, I was summarily suspended without pay. The public protest leads investigators to wonder if the ATR-72 has a deadly vulnerability to ice. Merci. Investigator Charlie Pereira visits the ATR's French manufacturer, Aerospatiale, to learn more about the plane's history. We embarked on a research effort to try to identify uh, all previous ATR 42 and 72 uh, roll control uh, incidents. He finds a disturbing pattern. And um, about five, five of those were found to be similar. Uh, after the fact in our review uh, to the Rose Lawn uh, case. One such incident took place in December 1988 in Mosinee, Wisconsin. An American Eagle ATR-42 had been preparing to land in icy conditions at Central Wisconsin Airport. The airplane was on approach uh, in severe icing conditions um, described as freezing drizzle and freezing rain. Captain Mike Bodak was the pilot that day. We were just on the last two legs of our trip before we'd be done with work. And uh, we were doing our descent. Um, everything was proceeding normally. Negative ice, this way. I'll call the flight center and let them know we're turning inbound. I hear in the tail a sound like that, but it just got louder and louder. have no idea what is occurring. I thought initially a propeller blade may have come off. It was as if the steering wheel wasn't connected to anything. The plane stalls. 
Its wings can't generate enough lift to keep it in the air. As I see I'm not getting any of the airplane back, I come up on the bar loops all the way. The engines are now really trying to fly. And at this point, I'm getting some of the airplane back. So I make a forward motion to try and break the stall. And it's still going terrain, terrain, and I don't have the airplane back yet. And my first officer says, and I say, max RPM. And he throws the props from 86 to 100%. And instantaneously, boom, we fly out of the stall. The plane is less than 1,200 feet above the ground. Captain Bodak has learned a sobering lesson about the ATR. There was no warning. The plane stalled without any warning. Planes do have warnings for stalls, but in this case, there was no warning. I got the first warning that I was in a stall was I was in a stall. But other pilots weren't as lucky. An ATR-42 operated by an Italian airline was flying over the Alps en route to Germany in October 1987. The plane lost control and crashed in the mountains, killing all 37 people on board. Ice was the main factor, but the final report blamed pilot procedures. For investigators, it's really important to look back at historical information about any airplane. You want to look for trends. Did any of your studies uncover a wing design flaw? Charlie Pereira wants to know if the engineers who built the plane could explain why an ATR-72 would go so badly out of control. To his surprise, he learns they knew that it had a susceptibility to icing. You've seen the flight data from the accident flight. Where would the ice have formed to cause that? When I asked uh, one of their oldest, most senior aerodynamicists who couldn't speak any English at all, what he thought uh, would be the shape and location uh, of an ice accretion that could cause uh, the behavior that we saw on the flight recorder for the Roselawn airplane. He drew up the airfoil section, a little shape just behind the de-ice boots, and said this was it. And the translation was that this is what will cause this problem after the de-icing boot. Investigator Charlie Pereira is beginning to understand how ice can affect the wings of the French-built plane. If the ice built up behind the boot, the crew would have no way to clear it. Still got ice. And even a small amount of ice can have a devastating effect on an airplane. Ice can disrupt the smooth movement of air over the wing. But how could so much ice build up behind the boot? Investigators contact Dr. Marsha Politovich for assistance. The NTSB called us uh, to help them analyze weather conditions in this case. Her research shows that the pilots of Flight 4184 likely flew into something they'd never even heard of. Something even more dangerous than ordinary ice. Now, based on the weather analysis, it looked to us like the kind of icing that plane encountered was from super cool large drops. Now, large is relative. What we're talking about large here is about the size of a human hair. Super cooled large droplets are about a hundred times smaller than a raindrop. They form inside storm clouds when the temperature is near freezing. But the drops don't freeze until they come into contact with something solid, like the wing of an airplane. Conditions that day were ideal for the formation of these tiny freezing droplets. We had all the clues that we needed, uh, a warm cloud top, minus 8 to minus 12 degrees C. We had drizzle formation near the top that was probably encouraged by some wind shear near the cloud top. And very little ice in the cloud, from what we could tell. On every lap of its holding pattern, Flight 4184 flew through layers of cloud that hit a small but lethal element. They just put that poor guy in the wrong place at the wrong time. Investigators learned that supercooled large droplets have a distinctive way of accumulating on an aircraft wing. 
Ordinary ice accumulates on the leading edge of the wing, where de-icing boots can get rid of it easily. But SLD act differently. These supercool drops hit the wing and slide back over it before freezing. This forms a ridge behind the boots, out of reach of the de-icing system. So as 4184 was flying in that type of environment, rather than the water droplet freezing on the protected surface of the de-ice boot, it actually ran behind the de-ice boot and froze on the metal surface. The pilots can't get a good view of their wings from the cockpit. They would have been utterly unaware of the danger taking shape. For the pilots, when they looked out their side window, they would see the outer portion of the wing. They definitely could not see the top of the wing where this ice ridge was starting to form. For Greg Feith, the investigation is coming to a head. His investigators think they know why Flight 4184 crashed, but they can't prove it. To make matters worse, the plane's manufacturer suggests that the Roselawn crash wasn't caused by an ice buildup, but by poor piloting. The NTSB thought it was an aircraft problem, and the French aircraft manufacturer thought it was a pilot problem and not their particular product. Fife wants to know if there had been problems with ice on ATR-built planes in the past. He finds troubling similarities between some incidents dating back decades. Using data from flight data recorders, investigators look at aileron movements from flight 4184 and compare them to the other incidents. They discover that on all those flights, the aileron deflected in exactly the same way. There's no input at all from the pilots. We knew that all of these ailerons were being commanded to move, not by the pilot, but in fact the disrupted airflow created by the icing event that the airplane had encountered. The physics of ice buildup explains why the control column on flight 4184 snapped to the right. Air turbulence on the wing was so powerful that it lifted the aileron, which caused the plane to roll. Since the aileron is attached to the control column by a cable, it jerked the control yoke to the right. The force of the turbulence pulling on the aileron was so great that even two pilots trying to counter-steer weren't able to bring the aileron back down. The forces were determined to be about 250 pounds, so for the pilot, it would have been trying to roll against 250 pounds of aerodynamic force. Worse, the ATR's control yoke doesn't have power steering, so those forces are transmitted directly to the pilots. The pilots could not fight back against the air pulling on their aileron. For Chief Investigator Greg Fife, supercooled water droplets that left a ridge of ice on the wings are now the prime suspect. But how to prove it? Now the real analysis began because we had to understand what was going on in flight with the airplane. We had good flight data recorder information. It only told us what happened, didn't tell us why it happened. We had to try and model this icing event some way. At the time of the crash, NASA was just beginning to study the effect of supercooled large droplets on airplanes. Investigators first turn to NASA for help. Together, they launch a daring experiment. They use a US Air Force tanker plane to create a cloud of supercooled water droplets. An ATR-72 flies behind the tanker. Yellow dye in the water shows investigators how the droplets cover the plane. The test should solve the final mystery. How had ice caused Flight 4184 to go so badly out of control? 
One of the primary purposes of flying the ATR-72 in behind the tanker was to understand how the ice accumulated on the airplane, but more importantly, the effect of that ice in varying configurations of the airplane on the flight control surfaces, that is, the ailerons. Investigators make a startling discovery. A seemingly harmless action meant to increase comfort on the plane may have led to disaster. I'm good. While American Eagle Flight 4184 was holding, Captain Orlando Aguiar notices that the nose is tipped quite high. This thing gets a real high deck angle in these turns. Yeah. Captain Aguiar knows that the plane's high nose angle was producing an uncomfortable tilt in the passenger cabin. You want flaps 15? I'll bring the nose down. Sure. Extending the flaps would have the effect of lowering the plane's nose, making the ride more comfortable. I guess Sandy's going woo now. <laughs> when investigators duplicated this maneuver, they found that it had a dramatic effect on where the ice ridge formed on the plane's wing. The flaps made the icing problem even worse. By exposing more of the upper surface of the wing to the oncoming water droplets, and that's one of the reasons why we got um, the ridge of ice where we got it was because of the flaps 15 configuration. That's much nicer now, flaps 15. The crew of Flight 4184 is unaware that a ridge of ice more than a centimeter high has built up on the surface of their wings. Eagle Flight 184 descent and maintain 8,000. Danny, 1,000 Eagle 184. The ice buildup has no effect on the flight until First Officer Gagliano begins his descent to 8,000 feet. I knew we'd do that. The descent increases the plane's airspeed. This triggers a warning from the flight computer telling the crew they're flying too fast with the flaps extended. I was trying to keep it at 180. Gagliano now retracts the flaps. But the routine gesture has a dramatic effect on the plane's aerodynamics. When they retracted the flaps as they started their descent down to 8,000 feet, the airplane pitched back up into a very nose-high attitude. Airflow over the ice-laden wing was disrupted when the nose lifted back up. That created the turbulence that pulled up the ailerons, sending the plane into a roll. The plane stalled and tumbled from the sky. Had this crew had about two to 3,000 more feet of altitude, there's a high probability that they would have been able to salvage or recover the airplane before it struck the ground. The NTSB has uncovered a deadly flaw in a popular airplane. There's a growing concern that unless something is done, this kind of accident would soon happen again. Investigators conclude that problems with the ATR's wing design make it vulnerable to this menace. The agency that regulates US aviation takes drastic action. We are going to issue an airworthiness directive this afternoon that will preclude the operation of these aircraft into known icing conditions. The FAA takes swift action banning all models of the aircraft from flying in icy conditions. This throws regional airlines like American Eagle into chaos. Public concern over the safety of ATR airplanes grows in the aftermath of the Roselawn crash. The most controversial charge, that the FAA had relied on the French authorities to test and certify the aircraft, then rubber stamped the results. Therefore, the ATR-72 was never really tested by the FAA in any way, shape, and form as though it was manufactured here. The plane's French builder proposes to fix the problem by making the de-icing boots wider so they cover a larger part of the wing. The company also rewrites operating procedures, 
forbidding pilots from using the flaps or flying on autopilot in icing conditions. In response, the FAA issues an amendment to their earlier directive, loosening operating restrictions on the ATRs. Most airlines decide not to take any chances. They move their ATRs to the south, where a warmer climate would reduce the risk of ice. The crash at Roselawn set off a flurry of new research into aircraft icing and the conditions that produce it. There's a lot of weather data out there. Satellites, radars, surface ops, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, the collection of data. New techniques in forecasting are being developed to show pilots where icing is likely to occur and help them avoid it. But we're working on ways to get it to the people who need it. Uh, dispatchers at airlines, um, meteorologists at airlines, and now even into the cockpit itself. Many of those changes will take time to come into effect. Pilots like Steve Frederick think that time will cost lives. The problem that exists is that there is no technology available today to the pilots or anyone on the ground to f accurately forecast or predict where these situations of bad ice are going to occur. Once these airplanes have been exposed to the bad ice, it's too late because these are no longer airline pilots, they're test pilots. And that airplane can fall out from under them and their passengers without any warning and in the blink of an eye. Don't miss Foreign Legion Tougher Than The Rest, a brand new series starting this big new Monday at 9. See that geotv.com for details.